This episode is brought to you by Tegas. Over the years of our partnership with Tegas, they have evolved from a pure expert network into a full company intelligence platform. Tegas streamlines the investment research process so you can get up to speed and find answers to critical questions on companies faster and more efficiently. The Tegas platform surfaces the hard to get qualitative insights, gives instant access to critical public financial data through BAMSEC, and helps you set up customized expert calls. It's all done on a single modern SaaS platform that offers 360 degree insight into any public or private company. As a listener, you can take Tegas for a free test drive by visiting tegas.co slash Patrick. And until 2023, every Tegas license comes with complimentary access to BAMSEC by Tegas, which makes it easy to search and analyze public company filings and transcripts. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. This is Jesse Pucci, and today we are breaking down CrowdStrike, a cybersecurity provider. Founded in 2011 by George Kurtz, the former CTO of McAfee, CrowdStrike differentiated from firewalls and anti-malware by building a platform that actively predicts threats rather than blocking attacks that have happened before. Today, CrowdStrike serves over 18,000 customers globally and is valued at $45 billion. To break down CrowdStrike, I'm joined by Roniel Desai, a senior public market investor focused on enterprise software. In our conversation, we discuss how CrowdStrike reinvented cybersecurity for the cloud era, why the pandemic and remote work drove a paradigm shift in the industry, and how the company helped the DNC identify Russian hackers during the 2016 election. Please enjoy this breakdown of CrowdStrike. Roniel Desai, welcome to Business Breakdowns. Hey, Jesse. Thanks for having me. Let's jump right in. What is CrowdStrike? CrowdStrike is a cloud-native cybersecurity vendor that specializes in the endpoint segment of the security market. The company was founded in 2011. The initial premise or underlying view is that a structural change has taken place to the way that we are setting up our IT footprints. That's changed the attack surface to now where you need to protect every individual device or laptop as opposed to just protecting one IT estate. Historically, that was very difficult to do. The development of the cloud allowed the creation of a new type of endpoint security construct where you could put an agent an agent being a piece of software provided by CrowdStrike that you would download to your laptop or your desktop or your phone. That agent would collect data on not just the actions that you were taking on that device with the internet or with your network, meaning like the things you're downloading or the things you're sending out, but it would also collect data on what was happening on the phone. When you open your mail app on your iPhone, you click on a link that routes you to an application. That's your iPhone mail app talking to the Reddit app, giving you the pop-up saying, do you want to open this in Reddit as opposed to open it in Safari? Those are apps talking to each other. So the agent would monitor all of those interactions as well. It would feed all of that information from each endpoint into a single threat graph managed by CrowdStrike. And then they would use machine learning to, in a live dynamic way, look out for anomalies in behavior. It could be as simple as, hey, this person lives in Southern California and they're getting a packet being sent to them from Russia. That seems weird. Don't accept the packet. But it could also be, hey, this app is asking for permissions to be authenticated, to send information via an email attachment or something like that, that the ESPN app has never asked for the save password in the middle of the app session. It was a way to go beyond the 
historical endpoint security, which was basically the McAfee firewall that we all saw when we got our computers in 1990. That was basically the best thing you had up until the 2015 year. Essentially, CrowdStrike and a handful of other people figured out how to make a much, much, much more intelligent endpoint as opposed to downloading a static application that was told at the very beginning that this is bad and this is good, and then just going off of that into perpetuity. We're going to get much more into exactly how it works and how it has grown. Can you give us just a sense for the revenue, scale, EBITDA growth? How big is this business and its footprint? Today's August 25th, around a $45 billion enterprise value. Their last reported quarter, they had ARR of $1.9 billion, which grew 61% year over year. Incredibly impressively, a year ago, that was 72%, so not a very sharp decline for something of this size. They have about 18,000 customers, which has grown approximately the same rate, about 60% year over year. That technically implies around 100K of ARR per customer, but there's a very wide distribution there. So their top 100 customers each spend on average a little bit more than 2 million. Their top 25 customers spend on average 4.5 million. 43% of their revenue comes from customers who are spending more than a million dollars. You sort of have these guys spending a lot all the way down to guys spending 30 to 40K. In terms of relative to other software companies measured by ARR today, they would be the eighth largest cloud-native SaaS vendor. To put things in context, no other software or SaaS company in history has been growing at the rate that they are currently growing at this scale of ARR other than Snowflake. They're currently growing 60% year over year. When ServiceNow Workday and Salesforce were at $2 billion of ARR, the three of them were all growing somewhere in the range of high 30s or potentially even low 40s. Maybe just to simplify do you have a couple of example customer use cases of what they might have done before CrowdStrike came along and then what CrowdStrike now does for them? This one's one of the most notable events in its history. In 2016, when the DNC thought that they might have gotten hacked during the Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump election, they brought in CrowdStrike to see, does anything look off to you? CrowdStrike put an agent on all of the DNC laptops and phones. And then very quickly after observing where traffic was flowing between apps as well as onto the internet, they noticed that a number of apps were sending without the users knowing information, data, identification codes to servers in Russia. CrowdStrike was then able to cross-check those either ports or IP addresses along with some of the specific methods to move data around that they were able to identify. And we're able to then basically trace all of that back to a very specific group of Russian hackers that were known in the CrowdStrike world as Cozy Bear. Then by backtracing the strategies that they had known that group to use in the past, they were able to sort of retrace the steps and figure out what they had done before CrowdStrike had even shown up. We're then able to provide evidence to the FBI, helping the FBI confirm that they had taking information out of the DNC and use that to try and help Donald Trump win the election that year. Just so we can draw a really specific line, if CrowdStrike wasn't there, what software might they have been using and what would have happened in that instance? Before CrowdStrike got there, presumably the DNC had a endpoint protection software product on all of their phones or laptops, but it was probably something more like the McAfee firewall that people saw when they were growing up. The McAfee firewall said, hey, like, you're not sending a virus that we already know about, so there's nothing we're going to stop. In general, firewalls themselves are there to stop what's called malware, an explicitly bad item that tries to get downloaded onto your hardware, which then, once the data is there, it itself does something bad to your network or your device. Whereas if you click a link on an email that you weren't supposed to, and now all it has done is give them access or allow them to see your password or something, there's nothing for the firewall to stop. And then once they are on your device and within the confines of the network that you're operating in, they can move laterally between apps, between devices, between servers, and then 
depending on how good they are or what they're trying to do, get to whatever they're trying to access and then figure out how to get it out. Tell me if this analogy is reasonable. The old school or the McAfee is almost like TSA airport security. It's like once you've passed that security, you can't bring a drink in with you and you can't bring certain knives in with you. But once you're past that, theoretically, you could do whatever you want and no one's really watching you versus CrowdStrike is almost like a casino. You may or may not come in, but they're watching the way that you're betting. They're watching what's going on with your winnings, your cards. They're watching all these other things that are happening in order to figure out if something nefarious is happening. Your analogy is exactly correct because even though it's a much smaller and weaker version, a McAfee firewall is trying to do the same thing that a supercharged Palo Alto firewall is, which is just be the gatekeeper of things coming in and out. But even the most powerful network firewall, the whole point is once it lets you in, it doesn't continue to follow you around and stop you again like you've gotten past the firewall. The McAfee firewall on our laptop is just one 100,000th as powerful as the Palo Alto firewall protecting our offices. It's a great segue into CrowdStrike would define endpoint protection as requiring two parts. The first is what they would call a next-gen antivirus or a next-gen firewall on your laptop. So as opposed to just being given a pre-written list of here's what you should look out for and say no to it, it would be connected to the internet and on a live basis, constantly getting a new list of here's an attack that just took place at another customer. They tried to do this. We've never seen it before. Now add this to your warning signs. That being the first. The second being a new module that CrowdStrike helped usher in, which is called EDR, Endpoint Detection and Response. And that's much more of what you described, which is actually looking at behavior and actions on the device and looking to see if once you've gotten past TSA, someone's still watching you to see if you're doing something strange, i.e. as soon as you walk past TSA, you leave all your bags on the ground and start running off for the bathroom in the opposite direction of the gate that you just handed them. Hopefully, a machine learning algorithm could figure out that that's not standard behavior. And from a customer market, you said that 18,000 customers, how many customers could there be? And who are they taking share from with this better approach? The extremely bullish view would be at their peak heyday, companies like McAfee and Symantec, who did the old version of these firewalls, had 500,000 customers. I think that that's not accurate because there's a ton of just very small mom and pop people who are not going to pay $100,000 a year for endpoint security. I would say the easiest bellwether to look at would be Palo Alto has 70,000 customers. They charge 20 to 25% premium above the next option in the market, which would be a Fortinet or a Cisco firewall. Then there are 70,000 enterprises out there that are willing to pay up for the best and the greatest and know that they have the absolute best of breed available to them from a security perspective. So that's one way to think about it. We can also just look at the TAM of what people are currently spending on endpoint security because it's not like a new product that CrowdStrike came up with a much better mousetrap for it. The last year, if you just IDC totaled up the existing vendors of endpoint security, it was a $10.3 billion market. I would say that that's a very misleading number. So A, by their measurement, it grew 30%. There's no way the number of computers grew 30% year over year. So the first point would be out of that 10 billion, 60% of it is still legacy vendors. The largest three of the old guard would be Symantec, McAfee, and a company called Trend Micro. A Symantec customer could be paying $1 per endpoint per month for just the very basic computer antivirus firewall, as opposed to CrowdStrike at list pricing, $16 for the next-gen antivirus plus the endpoint detection and response that actually tracks your behavior. And then an additional $6 to $22 per month if you want CrowdStrike to monitor that behavior for you. And we can get a little bit into that optionality later. Obviously, no one pays the full $22 list, but even at 50% of that, if you take a big chunk of that $10 billion of revenue and it goes from one to 10, that's going to change the TAM estimate. It's funny, I just looked up the prior 
year forecast that IDC had put out for the endpoint market in June of 2020. Their 2025 forecast estimate was 10 billion. A year later, in June of 21, that 2025 estimate had moved up to 13 billion. A couple of months ago, they put out their new 2025 estimate, and now it's 18 and a half billion. You shouldn't think of it as a static number, but it's really what were people spending on just antivirus before, then adding on endpoint detection and response, then potentially people paying the security vendors themselves to monitor or oversee that data to look for anomalies. And then when we were talking about the old endpoint products, there was no real incentive to put them on anything other than the computer that someone would be sending an email from. Whereas now, if you have a much more powerful, organic, live agent that can do a lot more, there's an incentive to put it on the servers within the building that you work on premise. And the reason that you would do that is if you have an agent on every single endpoint, even if someone has hacked into your IT estate, as soon as you figure out where they are within the network, you can just lock them in there at a very small level. So going back to your comment of the TSA pre-check, if you walk through TSA pre-check, but then had to scan a card every 10 steps that you walk to go from one gate to the other, it would be very easy if we at some point said, hey, we want to stop Jesse. He's at gate 16. Okay, well, now he can't go anywhere else. That functionality is very powerful and can only happen when you have these more dynamic endpoint agents as opposed to the ones of yesteryear. I have a bunch of questions around the market to follow up. So one, when you think about the TAM growing, the example you gave from 10 to 18, what was more misestimated? Was it the number of customers who wanted or was it the dollar spent per customer? Dollar spent. If you look at their estimates this year, they're now including some portion of the managed services component. They're including more servers. And now they're including an estimate of people putting endpoint agents on servers they spin up in the cloud. You would have never downloaded a McAfee firewall onto your AWS server. The idea that there's going to just be more endpoints or more pieces of security throughout that just means that everyone's going to spend more dollars on average. The other question I had was, you mentioned Palo Alto. Are they competitors? Is that how somebody would look at them? Or is one a substitute for the other? How would they define it? I am a big fan of Palo Alto. I would say that objectively, the one product area they have failed to make real headway in is endpoint security. They acquired a company called Traps earlier in the decade, and it just has not been up to the same level of quality as their core firewall that they're so known for. The two most competitive vendors with CrowdStrike are Microsoft and a company called Sentinel One. Microsoft has a basic free endpoint that comes with their overall office package. And then if you upgrade all the way to their E5 license, the most expensive one, with that comes their advanced endpoint product. It's called ATP, Advanced Threat Protection. If you're buying an Office E5 license for all the other reasons that you would buy an Office E5 license, and it comes with this free next-gen endpoint protection, maybe you say, well, I don't want to also pay CrowdStrike $10 per server computer per month. I'll just use the Microsoft one because it's not that good, but it's good enough. They're probably the second largest and second fastest growing. The other competitors in the market today, the legacy guys, like I said, still represent about 60% of the market in total. From a market share perspective, Trend Micro, McAfee's now called Trellix. They're probably both in like the 8 to 9% of dollars spent, which means they're actually probably way more than that percentage in terms of the number of endpoints that they cover because the ASP differential is so large. Symantec used to be the largest provider in the space. CrowdStrike has basically been pillaging their base ever since Symantec got acquired by Broadcom in 2019. So they've gone from call it 15% of the market in revenue terms back then to probably something closer to like 5% now. And what's the criteria? You're talking about Microsoft's endpoint software versus CrowdStrike. I mean, without being too arcane, like if you're choosing, what are you looking at? How does one know one is better than the other? So there are formal tests. There's an organization that will try and get past an endpoint and see what it does or doesn't stop. They put out the results of that once per year. 
I would say that it's a combination of what do you stop? What do you notice? Which is almost equally as important, especially when we're talking about more of the behavioral file list types of hacks. What can you automate or remediate on your own? Splunk and the sim market have an entire business model premised on just telling you something is wrong. That is where they tap out. There's a difference between a product that can do that versus one that can say, you have a hacker here and here's what we've done to contain them. And here are the permissions we've already turned off on that phone or that device or that application or whatever it is. There's the depthness of the data that you're picking up and that you're running analytics and cross-checking behavior against. And then the one that actually the other competitor still can't do is cross-checking across customers. If we all worked at the LAX, you and I are working at TSA and someone else is working in corporate in the back office and we all have the same endpoint module, we can look at behavior across that organization, like Microsoft could do that. Whereas CrowdStrike is cross-checking the behavior of the LA airport with the Houston airport, with the New York airport, and all their other 18,000 customers. So it's a far deeper level of insight. It seems based on their growth, the scale, some of the competitive discussion, this is a very special company. Maybe you can start by taking us back sort of the early days founding story, but then working that into what sort of structural advantages have they built over time that seem to be sustaining and growing? The company's story is fascinating. So the CEO is George Kurtz. He started a cybersecurity company in the 1990s that ended up being acquired by McAfee. He then became the CTO of McAfee. So it had like a front row seat window into what the endpoint market was and what it was doing and what problems it was solving and where the flaws in it were. So he leaves McAfee in 2011 to start CrowdStrike. He is joined by one of his colleagues who became the CTO of CrowdStrike. His name is Dmitry Alperovich. Coincidentally, also started a security company that was acquired by McAfee. He actually was the father of the trusted source reputation system, which is like a very widely used security protocol today. He was the VP of threat research at McAfee. Goes on to be a CrowdStrike CTO. They then named Sean Henry to be the head of their incident response team. So Sean had spent 24 years at the FBI, was the number two guy in charge of all criminal and cyber investigations, as well as all of their international threats and investigations and operations. Incident response is something very different than endpoint security. Endpoint security is truly software. Incident response is the guys you call when you've been hacked, and they show up and sort of assess the situation. So they figure out, did you actually get hacked? Who did it? Are they still in your network? Can we find them? Can we figure out what they stole? And then how can we remedy the security breach that you had so it doesn't happen again. George had this idea of using the incident response team to be proof of concept for the fact that their endpoint product was better than the ones in the market. They actually slow played product development because they were very focused on getting the agent right. You go to work and your boss is, all right, we're going to put CrowdStrike on your computer. You don't open a web browser every day and go to CrowdStrike.com. You download a CrowdStrike application to your computer once, then it sits in the background and you never notice it again. What they were very focused on was having that agent be A, lightweight, B, having the ability to be upgraded over time, and that single agent being able to do whatever they wanted it to grow into over time. So by the time they got to market with a product, they were actually the third next-gen endpoint vendor that had come with a viable product that was in GA. So the two companies that beat them, the first was called Silence, and the second was called Carbon Black. Silence had basically said they're just going to focus on the next-gen antivirus firewall. They said, as long as we can have that, be dynamically upgraded. We can figure out what people are trying to do and the malware they're trying to send. That in itself is such a big step up versus what's in the market today. So let's just get that out there as quickly as possible. Carbon Black had started as an on-prem product and then was trying to transition to the cloud, but they were trying to 
go more of the CrowdStrike route of doing both the antivirus and the EDR. CrowdStrike, meanwhile, just in the background with this FBI guy building up this really impressive incident response team. So in 2014, Sony gets hacked and they decide to call CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike shows up, their endpoint gets downloaded in a day across 40,000 endpoints in multiple countries. They figure out the next day that North Korea was the one who hacked Sony. I don't know if you remember, because Sony had done that movie that made fun of Kim Jong-il. So CrowdStrike figured that out in 2015 as President Obama was negotiating a cyber espionage neutrality pact with China. CrowdStrike found that Chinese hackers were trying to break into U.S. healthcare companies. That was front page of the New York Times. And then they stepped in and found the Russians guilty of hacking into the DNC. And that was when it really blew up. So that vaults them into the limelight. Then 2019 is incredibly important because Silence gets acquired by BlackBerry. Carbon Black gets acquired by VMware. And Symantec, who's the market leader in revenue with about 15% of the market, gets acquired by Broadcom. And Broadcom has the explicit intention and strategy of you have thousands and thousands and thousands of customers. Most of them don't actually generate EBIT. We're going to get rid of all of them except for the largest, and we'll actually monetize those. A huge chunk of the market was just told we couldn't care. That was all in 2019. You had your two biggest next-gen competitors acquired by legacy companies, and we all know that that tends not to go well because everyone leaves and you can't acquire talent anymore. And they tend not to be run as efficiently in those types of companies. And then COVID hits. Right as the playing field had sort of been cleared out, you have this completely out of left field exogenous event that completely changes the dynamic of security architecture and the demand for needing endpoints on your personal or work laptop, phone, whatever, outside of the four walls of the office perimeter. And CrowdStrike really stepped up into that and used that opportunity to cement themselves as the top of the line, best of breed player that was head and shoulders above everyone else in the market. Can you explain the COVID thing? What about us not going into offices all of a sudden opened up this opportunity for CrowdStrike? If you think about what the old security architecture paradigm was, it was essentially Everyone already shows up to the office. We have all of our assets in the basement on servers. We're just going to put a really, really good wall around those and make it so that anytime they talk to the outside world, it's going to have to go through this very powerful wall that nothing will ever be able to penetrate and we'll be all good. At the time, under that construct, if you were working from home, you would obviously VPN into the office to access your data on-prem applications. If your company was progressive enough to have an application or data in the cloud, as opposed to going directly to AWS, you would VPN into your office, go from your office on the network to AWS, back to your office, and then back to home. And that would be the same thing that if you were working from home and you wanted to access Salesforce. So as opposed to going directly to Salesforce over the internet, you would go from home to office to Salesforce, back to office, and then back to home so that all of the traffic still went through the office's network firewall. That was the only way they could guarantee it. That works if you have an office of 50 people and one person needs to work from home on Monday to take care of their kid. It doesn't work when all 50 people go home because now all of that traffic is running back and forth, back and forth through the firewalls and firewalls are capacity constrained. That back and forth is called a hairpin because it's a circular motion to it. If you are no longer going to have that hairpin to access your Salesforce account, the only way that you could get comfortable with that is to have some level of protection on the at-home laptop or desktop that provided what CrowdStrike did, or else you would just be worried that all someone had to do was hack into your personal laptop, then they could access all of the company's Salesforce accounts and drives and data, and that would obviously not be good. So it's almost like they were able to bring security much more locally, I guess, to these devices. As soon as everyone's sitting at home, that becomes the most important thing. Exactly. Let's talk a little bit about the business. You mentioned earlier, 18,000 customers, 1.9 billion in ARR. Walk us through their P&L and especially 
noting what the big drivers of growth are and what are the special parts of the business that show up in the PNL? I'll start with the special part of the business because it's one of the things I think is so fascinating about where this company is today in software architecture. I'm sure a bunch of your listeners read Ben Thompson, who loves to quote Clay Christensen's theory of interdependence and modularity. And it's one of my favorite investing principles, which is in every value chain, the most value accrues to the proprietary product that vertically integrates within the chain and everything else modularizes around that point of integration and becomes commoditized. And anytime one previously proprietary segment itself becomes a commodity, it opens the door for that proprietary value to shift to a new portion of the supply chain. If you think about client-server architectures of the past, what we effectively said was, we are going to choose simplicity at the infrastructure layer, because quite literally, everything is on servers in our basement. And that was going to allow us to have complexity at the application layer. You got the source code from a software vendor. SAP literally gave you the code, and then you could do whatever you wanted with it. That meant in the Clay Christensen model, the point where integration costs were the highest were at the application layer. So naturally, the client-server era led to software suites in the system of record application category. So Oracle, SAP, PeopleSoft, Siebel, Sybase. Fast forward 20 years to the cloud architecture, we basically flipped that completely on its head. Now we have chosen to take simplicity at the application layer. So no one gets to customize their code. They can only play around with the configurations that the vendors offer to everyone as options. In exchange for that, we get to have complexity at the infrastructure and middleware layers. Now we can have our infrastructure be on-prem. It could be in Amazon virtual private cloud. It could be in the public cloud. It could be in multiple public clouds. It could be a SaaS vendor. That would be impossible if you still had the customization element from the client server. What does that mean? It means that now you've commoditized the application layer. You've moved the point of maximum integration costs to the infrastructure and middleware layers. I would think that the implication of that is you're going to see the suites of the cloud era form in a completely different way than you saw the suites of the client-server era form. The obvious example of that is the three big CSPs, but I think you will see others, particularly ones that fill a void to customers who want multi-cloud or hybrid cloud architectures. And I think CrowdStrike has positioned themselves to be one of the two most likely new platforms within cybersecurity. Security has historically been dominated by best of breed vendors. You had absolutely no integration costs. CISOs wanted what they called CMA products, cover my ass. I don't care how much this costs. I don't want to get fired because I didn't pay up for whatever could have protected me. CrowdStrike's already doing 20% of its ARR outside of the core endpoint modules. And they're growing twice as fast, and we can talk about those. To quantify that a little bit, when they IPO'd in 2019, they had 10 modules you could pay for. Today, they have 22. They disclose on a quarterly basis the number of customers that have X number of modules. And so if we just look at the number of customers who pay for more than three modules, at the end of 2017, that was 30%. At the end of 2019, that was 50%. Today, that's 70%. The average customer today has almost five modules. Among their customers who spend more than a million dollars, that average is seven. They've done a phenomenal job of adding those via either organic R&D or like very small scale M&A that ensures architectural alignment with their core platform. I think there's a number of really low-hanging fruit remaining opportunities that they can continue to push into there. Can you expand on that for us? How are they thinking about growing their product range from a strategic perspective? And could you give a couple specific examples? One explicit example is they bought a identity product. So basically, when we talked about watching behavior on the endpoint earlier, originally that was really watching behavior between apps. What are the apps talking to each other about? Whereas now you can incorporate a lens into what the actual user themselves does, not just what the apps 
do to interact with each other. And you can follow that user through a network across different endpoints. They bought that company. It was really just a product in September 2020. They paid $80 million for it. At the time, it had a little bit over $6 million of ARR. Today, it has $50 million of ARR, and it's growing 30% quarter over quarter. Exceptional growth. If you wanted to sort of frame where they've already expanded the product suite to, I would define it as four buckets. One is traditional endpoint. So that's the antivirus, EDR, watching the behavior. They also sell the add-on we talked about earlier, which is managed services. So you can either pay to have them watch your data and let you know if they see anything that should be flagged, or you can pay for them to just take it over, give them the keys and say, like, if you see something, then fix it. And then within this endpoint suite, they have a threat intelligence product, which is basically if you get hacked, they then pull all of their data across other hacks and they stop everything and they figure out what data they've touched, where they've moved within your network, all of that's basically the product that you can pay more for to have insurance, smaller things like device control, a third bucket, which is just products that no one in endpoint has ever even touched before, didn't even exist. The identity one is one that they are the only person who sells that. And then the most important, and I think like is going to be the capstone of this creation of the next generation cloud security platform is they acquired a company called Humio, which is a low-cost cloud logging platform. Essentially, what that has now enabled them to do is launch a product that they came out with a couple of months ago. So previously, the thing that watched you on the endpoint was EDR, endpoint detection and response. Now they have launched XDR, extended detection and response. And they basically said, as opposed to just using all of the data that we have from our endpoint agents, which is a lot. They have application data, they have user data, they have information of how the endpoints are talking to each other. We're now going to sell a logging platform that you previously used Splunk or someone else like that. You can also dump into that data from any of our security partners. And those include Cloudflare, Zscale, or Okta, Proofpoint, ServiceNow, all of these other security companies are also giving their data into that same pool that CrowdStrike is running machine learning on. And it is truly the first time that anyone has been able to unify a view of the entire security estate in that way. There is a difference between what George has set his vision out for here and what Splunk initially wanted to do. And CrowdStrike has said, we don't need to have any control over you. We have so much granular control over every endpoint. We just want to have your data to know when we're being attacked. As opposed to the Splunk initial vision, which was if we noticed that malware is coming via email, we need to be able to go into your email client and figure out how to stop it there. CrowdStrike has said, hey, if we see in the proof point data, malware is coming in via email, we'll just turn off that laptop. We can just cut it off there because we have so many touch points throughout the entire estate. I think it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. And we're only starting to see the initial implications of that. The last fourth bucket, which is a very hot market right now, is cloud workload protection. We talked about what happens when you access the public cloud because CrowdStrike has their incredibly light agent that can be deployed instantaneously, doesn't require a reboot of the system, can be turned on immediately. They said, hey, if people are worried about someone hacking into their public cloud environment and then using that as a backdoor to get into the rest of their estate, just like when you spin up an AWS server, drop a CrowdStrike agent on it and it'll monitor that server for you. And it'll be able to turn it off the same way that we could turn off Jesse's computer in his home. They've already gotten to these four ranging broad buckets versus four or five years ago when they were just an endpoint company. Listening to you talk about all these different pieces of the business, do they understand security better? What's behind the distinctive growth that they're, is it all the above? What's driving that? I think one, they saw the vision of if you have a truly intelligent agent in endpoint as opposed to just a passive firewall, by then having those agents be dispersed on every piece of a network, that is actually more powerful than 
a firewall surrounding the entire network, even if it's not as powerful on the north-south monitoring or filtering, that trade-off is more than offset by the fact that you can see granularity through the network and you can follow a hacker or data or movement on a east-west basis. And then because you have controls and permissions at the endpoint level, whenever you do find the thing that you wanted to keep out, you can control the situation from there on an automated basis. It sort of sounds like the casino security method is better than the airport security method. The casino security method would have required a $1,000 firewall plugged into every laptop. That wasn't very feasible. They've been able to bring the cost structure down given the cloud technology that's out there today. I'd slightly caveat, it's not they brought the cost structure down, it's that because you have more intelligence at the endpoint level, you don't need as heavy of a lift. Talk about some of the other aspects of their PL that are noteworthy. When you think about just going through gross margin sales and marketing R&D, what are those numbers roughly and what stands out? Starting at the top underneath revenue, from a gross margin perspective, their subscription gross margins are about 77%. I'll caveat actually before I get into these, all of the margin numbers that I'm going to talk about are including stock-based comp as an expense. If anyone's looking at the adjusted numbers, then they're going to look slightly different. But subscription gross margins are 77%. They've been flat at that range for seven or so quarters. And the incremental margin has also been in that 77 to 78 range. What's the cost? What's the 23%? The normal cost that you could have in terms of posting the data in AWS or running your own data centers. We can get into this a little bit on the go-to-market sales and marketing side. But if you use a channel partner to sell a product, which basically every security company does, you don't pay that channel partner out of the sales and marketing line item. You give them a wholesale discount on the product that they are going to sell and they capture the margin that way. Implicitly, that's going to show up in gross margin for a security vendor to the extent they're using the channel. We talked about the managed services side here. One of their fastest growing modules is all these companies being like, oh, wow, this is awesome. Instead of having to hire a bunch of incredibly expensive IT people. I can just pay CrowdStrike a little bit more and outsource my entire endpoint monitoring and remediation process to them. I save a ton of money because I don't have to pay any of these people. CrowdStrike just takes care of it for me. It's an incredibly differentiating aspect of CrowdStrike's business, but it isn't pure software. It's not a one-for-one cost per customer. Like One person can manage multiple accounts or look at the same data across a plethora of customers, but there's less scalability there than normal. You write code once and it goes forever. In the last year in particular, they've acquired Humio. Logging, by definition, is going to be a lower gross margin business. That's offsetting some other things that would normally be tailwinds on the gross margin side. Over time, I think they'll be able to achieve some of those things. The more that they replace AWS with private data centers, They're now getting to the size and scale from a data perspective to where they can optimize their actual AWS footprint. So AWS 2 is cheaper than AWS 1. And once you have enough data, you can split stuff across the two of them and bring down 30 bips of costs. Obviously, as they move more and more of their data out of third parties into Humio, which they have acquired, and get more operating scale there, that will lessen the Humio headwind that they're facing. And then outside of managed services, the other modules that they get increased attach rates on, those should be accretive to the overall margin because, again, everything's being dynamically administered by this single agent that is on every endpoint. So you're not increasing the cost because the agent has stayed the same and you're just getting more money. I think over time, you could see this get to an 80% gross margin, but it's not going to end up being 85 to 90 like some of the lighter weight SaaS companies out there. Talk about sales and marketing and their unit economics. What do those look like and what's distinctive about them? I think the first on sales and marketing is you have to start with the go-to-market structure. The word channel gets thrown around in software a lot. Like there's just this one big ubiquitous channel. There's very different flavors of channel partners within software. And so there's agents, VARs, which are value-add resellers, MSPs, in this case, MSSPs, managed security software providers. 
system integrators like Accenture, and then Amazon is sort of their own animal. The big distinction between a value-add reseller and a managed service provider, a value-add reseller, they are considered an expert on whatever it is they do. So in this case, a cybersecurity expert. They have their trusted Rolodex of clients. They check in with their clients. Their clients say like, hey, what is the best and brightest firewall technology, endpoint technology I should be using, email or whatever it is. And they sort of trust these guys to give them the right recommendations. So those guys are buying from CrowdStrike at a discount. They're then selling it to the enterprise. They make some small margin on that wholesale spread. And then they get paid by the enterprise for installation and other services around maintaining that implementation. Managed software providers, on the other hand, they take over the entire management of the software. So you're paying them not just to source the product for you, but to like own it. CrowdStrike uses both of those, like I said, because they get paid through a wholesale margin that shows up in their gross margin, but it's not a sales and marketing line item. CrowdStrike does have a direct salesperson internally who is quote unquote on every deal. Let's say you were the Accenture account manager and Accenture next year is like, wow, CrowdStrike is growing 100% year over year. We're going to double our practice and we're going to go from 50 people to 100 people. CrowdStrike will definitely have to spend a little bit more in terms of they'll have to have more sales engineers to support them when they have big customers who want to see a demo and maybe a couple more customer service reps. But CrowdStrike doesn't have to double their spend to support an Accenture team that's twice as large. That has real implications for how that spend is able to scale over time and how much fixed cost there is within it. This is fairly rare. MongoDB or Snowflake, they don't have IT consultants running around knocking on companies' doors being like, who to use for your data warehouse? We recommend Snowflake. That's not a thing. Security is very unique. A bunch of these CISOs will defer to their channel relationship for what is the hottest or the best thing out there to use. They tend not to carry more than two vendors for a single product. Part of that is because they get higher wholesale discounts the more volume that they do. So they're incentivized to not spread out over too many different vendors. Once the market does standardize, so once there is a unequivocal, these guys are the best, you start seeing that demand get pulled at the customer level. Today, if Visa was moving off of their old Symantec endpoints and you were there, you're opted and you cover them and you showed up and you gave them McAfee and Trend Micro, they would be like, where's CrowdStrike? We know that that's what everyone else is doing. Why would you not show us that? And that is a really powerful circular dynamic to it. If you think about the incentives from the security channel, the channel seller themselves, they are driven by how much are they going to be able to make on services, either recurring or professional installation? How much margin is the vendor giving them? What's the total dollar amount they're going to be able to sell, both in terms of the ASP as well as other cross-sell opportunities? Obviously, like, will the product work? And then whether they're going to be able to make the sale. Once CrowdStrike has gotten to this best of breed status within the endpoint world and started to build out their platform offering, you start to see a flywheel develop where they are offering their channel partners about half the percentage wholesale margin relative to other companies. The channel partner is still incentivized to push CrowdStrike to their customer because they will make more money doing it. CrowdStrike's ASPs are about 20% higher. You get 20% more, plus maybe you get an extra one or two modules that are attached, plus the implementation is easier because it's faster, and you have the opportunity to cross-sell more in the future. If someone's giving you 25% of a wholesale discount and CrowdStrike's only giving you 10, you're still going to make more money with CrowdStrike. So now the entire ecosystem of security channel partners out there all have an incentive to have and push CrowdStrike to their customers. It's actually gotten to the point where they are now competing with each other. They're trying to get to a customer and show them CrowdStrike before the other local security channel partner is. And they're competing against each other by trying to pass along their wholesale margin to the customer. So CrowdStrike says, list price is 100. I'll sell it to you for 90. They're going to the customer and saying like, 
we'll sell it to you for 95, trying to just lock in the business. It's almost becoming like a loss leader for these distributors. It's a very unique sales and marketing model. When it comes to the unit economics, Raniel, can you walk us through what the actual unit economics look like? When we think about the question of unit economics and how that translates into the long-term operating model, fundamentally, what is the incremental return on invested capital today? And whether or not that translates into the long term is over time, how much capital can be invested? How does that impact what that incremental ROIC is? Fundamentally, those questions boil down to, A, what is the true growth investment that the company is making? And in this case, needs to be pulled out of the P&L because it's all being recognized as OPEX. The second being, how much ARR does that growth investment lead to generating? both now and over time. The third is, what is the incremental margin on those ARR dollars? The fourth is, how efficiently can that growth investment be scaled at this level of return? So for crowd, that math implies that CAC did improve, meaning it went down at the very beginning of COVID, reflecting like a shift in structural demand, but then amazingly it stayed at almost that exact flat level for eight straight quarters now with, frankly, very, very low volatility. So that math implies that they're spending about 90 cents to acquire a dollar of ARR at 30% incremental margins, which at 2% churn spits out a 40% incremental ROIC, which is obviously phenomenal. The other thing you can do is you can look at what Gap EBIT would be if Gap agreed with our view of what growth investment here is what should be taken out of OPEX and moved into CAPEX. If GAP did agree with our definition, then it would imply Crowd has a LTM EBIT margin today of about 24% and is showing incremental margins around 30%. The last component of that being the scalability of the growth investment and the sustainability of the currently observed incremental ROICs. That is ultimately going to be a function of the go-to-market model and competition, which I think are the two most important drivers to consider here. And the go-to-market model, I think we've already covered, is an attractive one because of these idiosyncrasies related to the security market and the position they've established and competition here. And the impact it has is ultimately going to be a question of whether they are successful in truly establishing themselves as a platform as opposed to just another best-of-breed vendor. Looking forward for this business, when you think about in 10 years, if it were to surpass expectations and grow to be really big, what happened kind of in the macro landscape as well as what did they do really right from a business perspective? I think the macro landscape really comes down to the security platform concept. If you look at the returns of software stocks during the client server era, which names outperform the market on either a revenue Kager, an EBIT Kager, or like the actual stock price Kager. If you went with one of the companies that ended up becoming a platform, you had like a seven out of eight chance. If you went with a best of read player in the ERP space, you had like a one in 40 chance. Finding companies in software that actually become true platforms and begin to consolidate spend and be that point of integration, those are some of the most attractive opportunities, I think, within software investing over cycles. Obviously, like in order to get their executions required, I think that these guys are arguably the best run marketing and go to market team in all of enterprise software. It truly is impressive. And they're going to need to obviously continue to do that as well as continue to find opportunities to build out additional offerings in that platform dynamic, either through R&D or M&A, add more products, be able to have not just things to sell, but things that are more efficient for the customer to buy from you versus the other vendors out there create integration costs that push them to you and establish gravity over time. You talked about the theory, right, of sort of the clients over the previous era versus this era. One connection I haven't been able to make is why would a security company become that integrated layer? What's changed such that it would allow a security company to become that layer? Previously, there was no integration cost across security products because they were all siloed in the one thing that they did. Your email security did not talk to your network security, which didn't talk to your endpoint, which didn't talk to your identity provider. Now you have this dynamic where 
because your IT estate has been spread out over a much broader infrastructure, you can't just be at one layer and have full coverage over the entire picture. If you are the best of breed cloud application software for AWS only, you're not going to get a very large share of the market because no customer who's multi-cloud is going to be able to use you. You extend that logic if you don't have insights into the posture or the configurations or the permissions that are being set for applications that are spun up in AWS as opposed to Azure. How are you actually able to say that you have secured those two environments on an equal basis? You've created value to having a single pane of access across all of these different elements of the IT estate. And by doing that, there's the potential for integration. In the next five, 10 years, what are the biggest risks and threats to the CrowdStrike business? I would say the first is like when we talked about CrowdStrike's view of XDR and they've taken what I would call the open view, which is like, here's what we do really well. We're then going to open the log up to anyone else who is a best of breed product to drop their information in and contribute to the cause. And we don't need to have control over you. We just need to know what's going on. The other side of that is the XDR vendors who are not opening up to third parties, but just saying like, we will own everything and customers will pick us because we can actually do everything. So the two vendors who can claim that would be Microsoft and Palo Alto. I have specific views as to why I think the open model is superior in the long run, but that's certainly not a definitive answer. Microsoft in general, I would say you should never want to bet against them in software. They should always be considered a threat. A lot of people don't invest in security as sort of a full stop just because they can't underwrite the pace or the level of technological change. Again, I think when you're able to separate products that are good based on just having a better source code as opposed to companies that are superior because of a architectural decision that's come about because of a paradigm change in broader IT. Those are certainly easier to underwrite than the former. Ultimately, like the returns here are going to be based on even if they do become a platform with stickiness and cross-sell opportunities, they still need to be able to find products that they can do better than other people and take market share in those areas. And if they run out of things to basically encroach on other parts of the security stack at the same economics that they're currently doing it at, that's ultimately going to drive CACs higher and unit economics down and change the return profile. The last question we ask every guest, Ranil, what's the big lesson here for builders, like executives and entrepreneurs? What's the lesson here for investors? And then where would somebody go for further study? Why don't just take it from the top? If you're a builder, executive, and entrepreneur out there, what do you think the one lesson is for those folks listening to this story? Patience on product architecture. Anytime there is one of these paradigm shifting moments, it feels like everyone's just trying to get out there first. And they feel like being first is going to be what allows them to win. These guys were third to market, but when they got there, they had the right product and the right scalable architecture that allowed them to compound that advantage over time. Similarly, continue to build the platform the right way and keep it to one agent and keep it all on one software stack without going through these big acquisitions that require different things to be commingled. The other one that sticks out is just focusing on the job that the customer is paying for, the job to be done rather. When they took that initial leap forward, it's not because they had a 1% better EDR machine learning algorithm than the other two next gen guys out there. It's because they were smart enough to include an integrated managed services offering. That is actually what enterprises wanted to pay for. Like they didn't want to pay for a software product. They wanted to pay for security as a service. And this was the one place where you could buy that. What's the big lesson for investors? I guess that's who they come to mind or one thinking about TAMs. Like if you had just looked at this at the beginning or at the time of IPO and said, like, this is what IDC says the TAM is. And even if they are best of breed, then they'll get to 10 or 15%, like the old guy got to 10 or 15%. And that's not a $100 billion company. And so it's not that exciting. The second is just history repeats itself. But to be cognizant of what the underlying assumptions are there. So like when I first looked at this company, I looked at it because I thought that in the past, security has been a place where best of breed companies do win. And so I was like, well, you know, if these guys can become a best of breed security company, then maybe it's interesting. 
it took me a while to come to the realization that just because security was a place that best of breed existed in the past doesn't mean that that's always going to be the case in the future. And unpacking why that was the case historically and why it won't be the case in the future. Like if I had just been a little bit more tunnel visioned on the best of breed thing, I may not have seen what is a much bigger opportunity. Where would you direct people to learn more about security, CrowdStrike, just further study? Their user conference is coming up, I think, next month. You can watch the whole thing online. It's actually fantastic because they just put all the videos online, all the decks and materials, and it's a lot less technical than you would think. They do a technical product overview once a year that they post the video online for it. And there's a presentation as well. I was a, those are definitely the two things that popped the top of my head. Well, Roniel, thank you for breaking down a complex but very special business. Thanks for having me, Jesse. To find more episodes of breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S.com. 